Skyscrapers should hook up. Seriously. Connecting tall buildings with bridges up in the sky just makes a ton of sense. Just ask this expert. The real passion that I have for sky bridges now is not about circulation between buildings. That's a benefit, but it's, it's much, much bigger than that. Yeah, I see them around in cities like here in Chicago sometimes, but those are not as impressive as ones like this. It's a cruise ship in the sky with pools, restaurants, and gardens. These kinds of things are much more prevalent in places like Hong Kong or Singapore. I want to get to the bottom of sky bridges. Why do we build them? Why are they such a staple in futuristic visions of cities? And what all can they do beyond providing expensive places to swim? Well, that's why I'm here at the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, or CTBUH for short, which is located here in Chicago. We'll meet with Anthony Wood, the president of CTBUH, who studied sky bridges for his whole career. And later, we'll visit the office of Moshe Safdi, the architect of that cruise ship in the sky, to see how it was done and show us what's next on the horizon, literally. So let's get started. The first sky bridge sprung up during the 16th century in Venice, Italy, where there was a problem. On one side of the canal, called Rio de Palazzo, you had the prison, and on the other side, the interrogation rooms of the Doge's palace. To walk the accused between the two, they'd have to go outside and cross the Pont della Paglia bridge. It was a huge hassle, so they decided to build a bridge directly from one building to the other, on the second level. It's known as the Bridge of Sighs, because the prisoners would sigh at their final view of Venice through the window before heading down to their cells. Solving that sad but practical problem is how sky bridges were born. They're pedestrian walkways connecting two or more buildings at an elevated level. The Bridge of Sighs isn't that high, or even that impactful to the way that the city of Venice works as a whole, but it has inspired countless artists, architects, and futurists to dream of cities that work differently than the ones that we're used to. Traditional cities limit all the movement and public activity to the surface of the ground. Parks, pools, fountains, play areas, restaurants, bike paths. There's really only one level in the city where these can occur on flat surfaces. On the flip side, moving up and down in buildings is usually reserved for isolated individuals or small groups in either elevators or escalators. But sky bridges offer another way. They offer those public amenities floating in the air, strung between buildings, and never touching the ground directly. The promise of sky bridges is to turn all of the hustle and bustle into a three-dimensional matrix that activates multiple levels of a city in a dense network of exchange. We've got to start to see the buildings and the city as a three-dimensional city. It's almost like, imagine that two-dimensional two infrastructure-rich ground plane. We've got to flip that vertical with the sky gardens, with the doctor surgery, with the schools, with the social infrastructure, and link with bridges. So, so my idea about a future city, and we're starting to see it in certain places in Singapore, in parts of China, is this true three-dimensional, infrastructure-rich mix of horizontal and vertical city. And that's, 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 that's what sky bridges can provide. These added arteries can reduce the congestion of the city overall by offering multiple alternative routes. Not only is this more efficient and convenient, but because these structures are usually enclosed, they can also be climate controlled. In challenging climates where it gets very hot and humid or very cold, sky bridges make it possible to walk between buildings and blocks comfortably. Sky bridges open up more possibilities for public space. They make more areas available for parks or other public amenities that wouldn't otherwise fit in a traditional two-dimensional city. It's like multiplying the ground. Sky bridges allow for more density in cities, while at the same time subverting many of the problems and congestion. Let's imagine a city, you know, that, that at the minute is a low-rise or a high-rise city. Let's say it's that big. Over the next 20 years, it's going to go from 1 million to 10 million people. That is not science fiction, by the way. That's been happening all around the world. That means we as a species need to somehow house a million new urban dwellers every week for the next 30 years. So where do those people go? You know, we at the council believe that they cannot go in the horizontal city because that's unsustainable in terms of the energy and carbon it takes to first build and operate the horizontal city. So it's got to go into more dense, concentrated, vertical cities. The benefits from an energy carbon, land use, uh, uh, you know, a myriad. This is why sky bridges are a staple of many modernist urban utopias of the 20th century, like those of Ludwig Hilbersheimer, Hugh Ferris in his Metropolis of Tomorrow, or in films like Metropolis. 
Yet curiously, even 100 years after these futuristic visions were conceived, most cities don't really deliver on this interconnected dream. There are lots of reasons for this, which we'll get into, but recently there's been a noticeable movement in this direction with some of the world's most ambitious constructions being conceived around the mobility and spectacle that Skybridges offer. The most iconic came in 1996 with Caesar Pelli's Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur. Not only are these twin towers the tallest in the world at the time, they were also connected with a spectacular double-decker skybridge that spanned between the 41st and 42nd floors, the highest two-story bridge in the world at the time. Unlike the early Venetian example, here the bridge is designed from the outset as a public connection within the navigational network of the building. All elevators stop at this level. If you're going to go above or below, express elevators will drop you off here to hop on a local elevator that will take you directly to your floor. So the 41st floor is an important node in the complex choreography that ensures people have the shortest elevator rides possible. This is where people are mixing together on a public level like you would normally find in the first floor of a skyscraper. This takes place at the median location for the density of people inside of the building. While the Petrona Towers are 88 stories tall, they taper toward the top and thus give a greater density of people at the bottom than at the top. So the 41st floor is the midpoint of where people are in the building. It turns out this is the ideal location for a skybridge. The skybridge is a double story fire rated element between the two towers that's part of the fire strategy. People in one tower can evacuate horizontally to the next tower. They can use elevators in the safe tower and get down to ground. And, and the use of that as a strategy enabled them to omit one fire stair from level 42 down in each of those towers. So think about that as a financial saving, yeah? One fire stair might be 15 to 18 meters squared times two towers times 42 stories. That adds up to a lot of money. That probably financed the sky bridge. So circulation-wise, the Petronas towers work like a single organism, but structurally, they need to maintain their independence. That's two towers with a bridge with two struts. But when you look in detail, this, this, if you imagine this bridge coming in, it does not, it's not connected to the tower. It actually sits within an aperture so that it can move, it can move within that aperture, obviously not move to the point where it falls down. And even the struts then that connect to the tower lower down are on a ball joint. So the whole thing can move. So it's supported between the two towers and completely safe, but you have this ability for the towers to move and the, and the sky bridges to move independently to the two towers. But all this is almost opposite to what happens in the nearby Marina Bay Sands Resort in Singapore designed by Moshe Safdie's office and built 15 years later in 2010. Instead of being located in the middle of two towers, this sky bridge is at the top of three, 15 stories higher. The roof has the biggest potential in a tall building. So Marina Bay Sands recognized that. So that first of all, they used the roof and then they brought in the sky bridge to link the roofs together and extend them. So we've got this fantastic urban park on the 50th story, you know, overlooking the central business district of Marina Bay. It also includes two and a half acres of activities like gardens, restaurants, an observation deck, and an infinity pool. And it's this pool that presented a new kind of engineering challenge. You see, it's 151 meters long and in order for it to present the effect that it just ends, water needs to flow over the edge continuously. So this edge needs to be dead level and can't deviate more than four millimeters over the course of the entire length of the pool. But the buildings are moving around all over the place, sinking into the soil, swaying in the wind. This seems to be the entire lesson of sky bridges. How can something which is fundamentally conceived of in parts allow for the system to behave as one large single organism? To test this hypothesis, I recently visited the office of Moshe Softy in Boston and met with Jaron Lubin, the project architect for the Marina Bay Sands project, who showed me how they approached the design of sky bridges. This is a proposal for Columbus Center, which is an early tall building. It has a little miniature bridge between the two towers. This predates the um, Petronas Towers with the bridge here, which is pretty interesting. Let's, let's jump down. The, the team is doing a review right now. We'll go into the model shop. So this project is called Raffles City Chongqing. It's a 11 million square foot uh, mixed use project in China, um, super complex. It's got, it sits on this huge, basically like big rock with intermodal transportation center below, two million square feet of retail, eight towers that are arranged as a cluster, all connected by this um, 
kind of skyscraper on its side. It's a, we call it the conservatory, which is an evolution of the bridge that we designed in Singapore the, at the Marina Bay Sands. And it has the lobby of the hotel in there. The, it's got swimming pool, meeting rooms, and amenities for the hotel and the residences that are in the project. This is kind of a random array of um, proposals for a mixed-use development in Korea up there. And each one has a kind of different um, attitude about how towers can cluster around. This one, you kind of get this like, like total stepping array of sky parks, plural. It's not a singularity, but we were playing around with the, <laughs> the kind of wild idea that you could create this like three-dimensional system of of gardens, both within here, the bridges are actually inhabited. So we take the structural depth of the bridge that you need anyways to span, let's say 30, 40 meters, and then you inhabit it with program in different ways. So, so this is the tower, it's a 55 stories. And we took the top off here. So this is like the latest in what you can do on the top of the tower. It's actually kind of wild. We're taking the sky park idea and and layering it into three levels, each with their own pool. And so each pool has a different character and different quality to it. One of the most fascinating projects is called Sky Habitat. It's a three-dimensional matrix of homes designed to bring nature into every level of the building. Terraces, balconies, and communal gardens adorning the entire structure, allowing residents to enjoy the landscape, the abundant light, and the refreshing air. Sky Habitat's stepped form is reminiscent of a historical hillside town, and the complex is ingeniously interconnected by sky bridges that serve as the backbone of the complex. And the idea here is that we try to open this up. I mean, this is like super dense. There's 508 units here in these two towers, and then even the smallest unit benefits from these communal spaces, which are these garden bridges that span across here. While it's very dense, the people, the residents who um, are lucky to live here have opportunities to hang out in all these gardens and on the bridges and take advantage of that. This brings us to the question, if sky bridges are so great and clearly important for the future of our urban environments, then why do we see them in places like Singapore and not so much in places like New York or Chicago? Who has the vision to create this three-dimensional city? Because it's a long-term project and that's where Western politics fall down. Yeah, because even four years is a long time in politics. So who has the bravery to say, we're gonna set out for this, for this vision that might take 20, 30 years or longer even to develop? In most cities of the United States, the area of the land for a city was first divided up into parcels, usually with the aid of a grid. Streets are intertwined within the grid, parcels sold off, and buildings built neatly on top of each parcel. The buildings respect the initial act of subdivision, there are exceptions, of course, but for the most part, this process yields buildings that behave like little islands unto themselves, bobbing within a gridded sea. If we want sky bridges to become a common feature in high-rise designs, not just connecting two towers, but forming an extensive network within the city, we face significant challenges. Clients and building owners must be willing to embrace the idea of physically connecting their buildings at height and accept the implications that come with it. This idea of the 3D Connect to City needs to become delivered through pri private public partnerships. It's not, it's not just the domain of the developer, because it'll never happen if it's just the commercial incentive. It's about the government, through taxes, as they would at the ground plane, providing the sky gardens or the schools or whatever at height. These opportunities are becoming more and more frequent for one architect to design many towers. So it's a great kind of responsibility to figure out how to do it in a way that it's most beneficial to the people who will occupy and live in these spaces and work there. Institutions in Singapore, like the Urban Redevelopment Authority, or URA for short, guides land use planning within the extremely dense country, and they're exceedingly good at it. They offer development incentives that make it beneficial for developers to include green space and sky bridges. You can build more densely and therefore make more money if you build with these features into the design. So they call these lush incentives, landscape for urban spaces and high rises. There's no accident that when you walk around Singapore, you see the sky bridges, the sky planes, you know, the green walls, all these things. It's all a result of government incentive, government policy, government regulation that has helped to foster that atmosphere. 
As we look to the future, skybridges are likely to become more integral to our urban and architectural design in lots of different places. With increasing urbanizations and density with sharpened focus on sustainable development, these elevated connections offer a viable solution for efficient transportation, improved connectivity, and enhanced urban experiences. We just you know, published a book on this at the Council, Space Across, Sky Bridges in the Future City. I mean, there are almost a hundred examples. Whether functional or iconic, Skybridges will continue to shape the way that we navigate and experience cities, transforming them into interconnected, vibrant, and accessible spaces. You'll give about 80,000 hours to your career. 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year for 40 years. That is a lot of time, and it means that your career is probably your biggest opportunity to make a positive impact in the world. And getting that right is too important to leave to chance. Platitudes like follow your passion, they only get you so far. And is it really the most sound advice? That's where this video sponsor aptly named 80,000 Hours can really help you out. They're a nonprofit, absolutely free resource for navigating one of the most important decisions of your life, what career path you should take. With 80,000 Hours, you'll find smart collection of resources, including individualized data, job boards, podcasts, and more, all in service of finding you a career that will make the most positive impact on the world. They've done over 10 years of research alongside academics at Oxford University to figure these things out. Because they take an evidence-based approach, they will make concrete recommendations on questions like where should I work if I actually want to make a positive difference in the world, or what can I do today to start planning a fulfilling career. Everything they provide is free forever because they are nonprofit. Their only aim is to help people find the most impactful careers that they can. To get started planning a career that works on one of the world's most pressing problems, sign up now at 80,000hours.org slash Stuart Hicks, and you'll get a free in-depth career guide just for signing up. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also leave a comment with your thoughts about Skybridges. I love engaging the discussion. While you're here, check out some of these other videos which come out every other Thursday. See you over there.